Welcome at the Bali again. Uh, wonderful to have you here. Also, well, welcome to those of you who are watching uh, us through the live stream. Uh, my name is Annette van Soest. Uh, I'm a journalist and I'm honored to moderate this uh, discussion tonight. For those watching from home, um, we have just seen Two Minutes um, to Midnight, a film by the artist Jael Bartana. Uh, the work was initially released as an experimental uh, theater performance, and uh, the performances took place in 2017 and 18, and the film is composed um, using filmed material from those uh, theater performances. Five actors, uh, for those who haven't seen the film, um, play an all-female government of a fictional nation. The government is striving for a total disarmament, but is confronted by a nuclear threat, nuclear threat from a male leader of a hostile country. You all recognized him, Mr. Twitler. What to do? Um, that's the big question of this film. Uh, reconsider or continue uh, the process of disarmament. Um, real life female experts are brought in to advise the actors. Um, we are organizing this evening in cooperation with Annette Geling Gallery. And if you want to see, if you haven't seen the, the film yet, uh, you can. The gallery is screening two minutes to midnight uh, until the 11th of February. Let's get started. With me are, um, first of all, the artist, Jael Bartana. Give her a warm welcome. <laughs> and also Marlies Glacius, professor in the field of international relations and po political science. Welcome. Yes. And Farah Karimi, a member of the Senate of the Dutch Parliament for GroenLinks. Um, before becoming a senator, she was a member of Parliament, um, where she focused on international policy, justice, and military strategy. And uh, she was born in Iran. Um, very well, welcome to you all. Um, let's start with you, Yael. Um, you are born in Israel, where uh, military service is mandatory. Um, in what ways have your experiences in the army um, shaped or influenced this project? Well, <clears throat> I guess it is uh, the core of uh, the, <clears throat> the core of the question. Actually, the, everything began with the question: What will happen if in Israel and Palestine women uh, <clears throat> will take, uh, you know, rule the both sides, and what will happen if? Uh, so it actually started there because because I come from Israel because I grew. Up, up in a, in, a, in a situation when war is always is part of the everyday life. It's part of the, <clears throat> the it's, it is the trauma and is it's, it's part of the collective consciousness. It's about, it's, it's just there. It's part of the, the language, it's part of the body language. It's, it's just constant. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, I left Israel actually in, uh, in the 90s, so I, I, I actually look at it always from from the outside, from the you know as an outsider looking in my own uh, um, upbringing. So it is. It I, so it, the question of started. What if women rule the world? What if women rule in Israel and, and Palestine? And then I decided to extend it to uh, to the world. But what was your experience um, doing service? Um, well. My experience is, uh, it, it's, it is long, long ago. So I, go, I was 18. Um, and um, it, it was a traumatic experience for me. It, it was not, it's some, it's not it, I think I would not, if I was uh, not so much indoctrinated by the fact that I, at the age of 18, I would have to join the army uh, if I was maybe grow, uh, raised a bit uh, later age. I mean, in. Growing up in the 70s uh, and 80s, uh, it was really part of the, it was very clear that I would end up 18 and joining the army, but uh, the, things changed. There's much more uh, resistance, um, uh, at least to certain kind, but I, I don't want to go too much into uh, politics right now in Israel, uh, but I, I um, I would say it, uh, of course, informed me in many ways. And, and it was a defining uh, and it, experience. I, and it was a very defining experience. And actually, my very, very first videos uh, 20 years ago, uh, shown at Annette Henning Gallery, 
called Profile. It, it is about a female a soldier who um, first time actually holding a gun and we viewing her experiencing the first time holding this machine, the killing, mm -hmm. the killing machine. Um, so um, it was, uh, I would say, from the very early artistic uh, practice, I was always concerned with this uh, national identity and, and consciousness and um, what it means to be, what is this, uh, what is the identity, how it is defined by the state and uh, by the rituals and by uh, the indoctrination. Um, as I said, the performances were filmed in 2017 and 2018. Um, today, the threat of a nuclear conflict has become more and more real uh, because of Putin's war in Ukraine. Would Two Minutes to Midnight have become a different project if you would have made it today? Um, so, I mean, it, the, the film obviously is reacting to the fact that uh, uh, Trump was elected in 2016 and the, the doomsday clock was actually uh, moved really to, two, uh, it was two and a half minutes and then moved to two minutes to midnight when, uh, after, after President Trump was elected. And uh, during the process of uh, working on, on the production, the theater production, uh, we wanted to take into consideration the reality and, uh, and really um, playing with the fiction and the reality at the same time, uh, um, seeing how this is affecting, you know, how it is, how we create one, on one hand, the uh, uh, fictive uh, female uh, government, mm -hmm. Uh, and having constantly this uh, character as a as antagonist, uh, threatening. Uh, um, so now you will blend a different reality into the project. I, I or? think. I think what is interesting is how uh, this, uh, how the film and its fiction are uh, adapting. It's the, uh, ad ad adapting according to the reality. There is a suddenly a new new concerns. Suddenly, it's not just about the Cold War. Mm. Uh, of course, when um, Kubrick was uh, cre he created this film in the, in '64, it was during the Cold War era. He was Doctor Strangelove. Doctor Strangelove, yeah. yes. The film Doctor Strangelove, where this film is based on Doctor Strangelove. The whole set is based on uh, Doctor Strangelove. That the war room and only men around the table. Uh, trying to make a decision um, how to go about with the nuclear uh, and the war between Russia and, and the U.S. Um, <clears throat> so um, it referred, it was re very much referring to, to that time in the 60s for him, and I wanted to actually bring it to the table, one, because it is a taboo, in, mm -hmm. at least in the context of Israel, it is taboo. Nobody talks talk about nuclear weapons. And um, and and uh, Trump was talking about it. He brought it to the table. It was part of the d discussion, and with North Korea. And mm -hmm. uh, so, it it to me, it also made sense. Even though a lot of people criticized me at that time, I remember uh, why are you bringing this as the main topic for uh, women around the table. There is the climate change. We should focus on climate change. Um, but the, um, for me, the it was very important to focus on, sub on the subject and to have sort of a, a men talk done by women. So uh, taking out all the men and bringing only women. And, and also it is a platform for women to experience a situation that they never experience in their own uh, uh, daily life. Um, women never experience to sit only with women unless there is a feminist uh, activism where, mm. you know, so. Yes. Um, and, and the, the film uh, reacts to uh, Dr. Strangelove. Um, another difference is Dr. Strangelove, there was a, a woman in bikini. Uh, you uh, had the man, half naked man, enter uh, the room. Um, and, and that showed, I think, really well that um, there were scripted elements. But also, those, the real life experts, they, they didn't follow a script, so they reacted very naturally. Um, also when that man came in. Um, were you surprised by the conversations that came out of it? Um, <clears throat> so these are what, what I call the theatrical tricks. Uh, and these are also elements when, when you do um, 
to shift conversation because I did not want to have a conversation only about nuclear weapons. I wanted to talk about gender issues. I wanted to shift the conversation. And of course, nuclear has you know the shape. I mean, it is an engineering shape. It has to be that shape, of course. But it is symbolically interesting that the shape is as is. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I, I wasn't so surprised. I trusted the women are so amazing. I mean, the, the whole the entire process of getting to know each of the experts, uh, and I, I trusted this will be a very interesting uh, um, conversation and they will not be too offended by the fact that I do all these tricks. They did not know anything about what will happen on stage. Uh, they only knew that there is a, there, there are just, there is a president, there, the actors who are playing uh, ministers and the president and there, there is the issue of nuclear threat, but they did not know anything. So the authenticity, uh, authentic, Authentic reactions were re very important, and that is actually the, thea the theater that actually uh, was uh, very important to you know have also entertainment experience for the audience. Uh, we had five nights, 600 people sitting in every uh, 600 people in the uh, audience uh, sitting in Volksbühne in Berlin, uh, full house, uh, a lot of expectation about the question: What if women rule the world? Um, so it had to be also entertaining at the same time. Let's open up the conversation. Um, what did you think of the film, Marlies? Um, for first of all, um, I grew up in the 1980s and it brought back for me a lot of memories of um, that anxiety of really thinking, you know, this bomb could drop any moment it was in the films we watched and the music we listened to and the conversations. I remember kind of being in a park with uh, my cousin. I was 13, she was 16 and a few friends. And, and one of the guys there said to my cousin, you know, if you knew that the bomb was gonna drop in 45 minutes, would you sleep with me? You know, we could lose our virginity <laughs> together. My cousin was having none of it. She said, no, I'd go home to my family. But the fact that it could be a chat up line, I think gives a sense of um, how real it was for us then in a way that I think uh, has not come back to the same extent, whether it should or not. Um, what really confused me about the film was the way that it seems to mix between talking about nuclear disarmament, nuclear weapons, and disarmament in general. Also with these strange memories of the president, which are about guns, not nukes. So, and to me, those are two completely different things. So yeah, that's something I wondered about. Can you maybe react um, or reflect on that? Are yeah. they memories or are they visions? What, what? Well, it's, it's in, in the eye of the beholder, but um, yes, I understand the confusion. It's not a straightforward film. It is a reflection uh, on, on many different topics and also uh, it is a fiction. What this, the film is actually, what you see is actually never happened because uh, it's a com uh, I com 40 different act, uh, experts uh, in 47 minutes, there is a, there is, there is, there wasn't re a real, uh, you know, dialogue. It was all made up, all the kind of rescripted. But it was Im important for me, as I said, to to move from nuclear to gender issues and to see um, um, how actually the women or how this film allows uh, to open a conversation about the topic. It's not bringing a very clear uh, con conclusion, I would say. Um, um, what confused you with the black and white uh, footage is actually, uh, it is a symbolic gesture, you know, that the, actually she decides to bury weapons. It is, of course, it's not nuke, um, but it's uh, on the level of uh, symbolism, yeah. Farah, what, uh, how did you look at the film? And, and what does it relate to, to you? Um, first of all, congratulations, because I think um, it, the film actually deals with uh, many, many different topics and uh, really has many uh, layers. Um, as, you, um, as you yourself also mentioned, uh, the gender issues, um, very much also the whole geopolitical issues are there. And um, uh, what 
was very interesting to me uh, was uh, constantly actually um, listening to these different arguments. And, um, and this diversity of voices, of course. I mean, it is really very interesting to see how you have been able to bring so many actually voices around the table. And, um, and that showed to me actually the complexity of the debate and conversation. I mean, in my daily life as a politician, but also as, uh, you know, I, I have been heading also Oxfam for more than 10 years. And many, many of these topics I have been dealing with and uh, know all those uh, conversations and so many dilemmas. And that's, I think, really very, very important also knowing what is going on in our world. Um, and there were voices that I could identify myself uh, absolutely with. Can and you give an example? Yeah, I mean, this the one very strong one. So we are not only women or we are not only men and we don't want to be defined by our gender, but there is so much in between. And uh, so I think this is also something that I think and, uh, and I'm much more interested in knowing what the people think and uh, uh, how they act and not what gender they have. Uh, and I think that that was also very interesting to see um, this all different actually voices that, uh, that were brought uh, to the t around the table. So, and then again and again, I was actually uh, translating this conversation to the current situation. Uh, In what way? Uh, we know uh, that maybe the nuclear threat is not a kind of imaginary thing at this moment with the war of uh, Russia against uh, Ukraine. Uh, we see actually now uh, there is absolutely no conversation and no big debate on whether we should deliver weapons to Ukraine. Actually, we are investing much more in defense and in uh, you know, uh, military capabilities in our countries. There is no controversy about that. So interesting thing is, uh, uh, also as women, we have uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Germany being uh, a woman from my own party, uh, which actually has roots in pacifist movement, uh, but nonetheless actually supporting this and uh, being a very strong advocate of uh, using military capability. Didn't she so resign? So it's quite confusing. Yeah. Um, Baerbock? Ah, uh, no, not Baerbock. <laughs> no, uh, defense. No, not defense, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I, I thought, of Minister, I thought you foreign. meant defense, no, 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 but Minister Foreign, of foreign Affairs, yes. Annalena Baerbock. Yeah. So, um, so that, that, that makes it even more actually complex than mm. uh, you have in your uh, movie. Um, Marlies, uh, the, the gender, is it actually a topic uh, within international relations studies? Yeah, it's actually rather a big topic. Um, and that's part of the reason I also asked about, um, you know, this distinction between <laughs> nuclear weapons and, and conventional conflict, conventional disarmament. Because as international relations scholars, we know almost nothing about nu nuclear weapons um, or even the possession of nuclear weapons. So these old debates from the 1980s, you know, about whether deterrence works and nuclear weapons actually make you safe or whether they're actually dangerous. All our knowledge is very hypothetical. It's all theories. And I think if one thing has changed, we have a lot more humility about that now than perhaps we had a few decades ago. When it comes to uh, conventional or political violence and women, we actually know quite a lot. Um, Women are not natural pacifists, and I think Gail yeah, showed that very well in their film. Women are human beings. Women they do not cringe. solve. Yeah. They do not solve every conflict by singing around a bonfire. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not as if yeah, just adding women to a conversation and then stirring well is going to get you better solutions. 
But what we do know, and in fact, one of the experts said it, is that when women take part in peace negotiations, when they're actually signaries to peace negotiations, the, the peace tends to last longer, be more durable. Um, there tends to be more political reform in such um, peace agreements. There tends to be better implementation of what has been agreed. And the link, the reason that that's the case seems to be not because women are naturally more pacifist, but because these women in the negotiations have natural ties to um, women's civil society groups, women's peace movements, and therefore have a better sense on the ground of what will make for a durable peace. So that is one of the things that we know about conventional war and that actually came up in the film as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's actually also what we know from really the experiences of uh, including uh, women in uh, negotiations and uh, peace processes. Um, uh, the point is that normally when peace processes start, uh, the, the, the first steps, it is very, very difficult to get really women involved because there is, the, the, there is much more on that hard uh, topic of disarmament and uh, um, peace negotiations. But later, when uh, the agreement uh, is more or less done and the, the military part of it, but then you really try to translate it in the daily life, those agreements then, and you include actually women's voices there that, that, that really makes a big, uh, big change. And, um, I, I, and I am really very much uh, an advocate of having the diversity of voices around the table, really being inclu inclusive in, 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 the, in, in all the approaches because uh, only one group, only one, a uh, specific uh, um, agenda is not going to help us, but the diversity and really inclusion, that's, that's what works, I think. Mm. Yeah, El, yeah? No, I, I would like to add, um, first of all, it's not just about women, being women, it's about being feminist women. This is a big, big um, change you know, in, in, in the attitude. Um, um, just to go back to the inclusiveness and having, uh, I, I, what I found out during the, working, uh, it took about three years to work on this project, and uh, it was very, very important from the very, very start to have uh, to be very inclusive and have uh, women coming from different backgrounds and different uh, urgencies. Because when women coming from different urgencies, they, they talk di very differently, you know, about the situation. They talk about having Kalachnikov as a, as a way to resist men. Um, so uh, even though it was, of course, in the, uh, one uh, one play, one theater play happened in Aarhus in Denmark. It's uh, Scandinavia, of course. The NATO involved a lot of women are involved in NATO discussions, and um, I, we couldn't, you know, in terms of budget. But we we, we try to to see women that re refugees that actually living in Scandinavia to include them in the, in the project. Uh, different experiences but coming from a real war situation, uh, not, unlike uh, women sitting in Denmark talking about war, is very different from uh, we, women coming from the <clears throat> from the battlefield. So um, and also for in Germany, we we try to be as much as we can in, inclusive. Um, so yeah, and, and, and actually the reason why I wanted to make a film, why I insisted so much uh, on making a film was because uh, when you buy a tickets for one night, you can see only one five, you know, you can see five act, uh, actors, but when you buy a ticket for a film, you can see many more uh, voices, many more. Uh, so the kind of, uh, the idea of uh, inclusiveness uh, is really appearance and, and on the table, yeah. And, and uh, how, easy or difficult was it to find these experts? Were they uh, keen to uh, participate in this artistic experiment or did you yeah. have to use your powers well, of persuasion? Well, I, first of all, I should, you know, a disclaimer, it's clearly not just me doing working on such a mega project. Um, it was first invited to by Manchester uh, uh, Theatre Festival. They were the first to show a very different version of this uh, same question. 
Um, it, it, is, it was a big team of uh, uh, amazing people, uh, a lot of women working on this uh, and uh, approaching uh, and curating every night. We approached many, many different women. Most of women were very, very excited about uh, uh, taking part. Uh, you know, it, it is a great platform for, for women. Um, uh, and it is a... Uh, some of them I realized later that actually they're actors and not just uh, activists, but actually, you know, they love acting. So for them, it was a great platform to, uh, to go on theater and play in front of the audience and, and such and play themselves, you know, play themselves in a fictional uh, situation. So, so they could actually really bring their own experience mm. into uh, this very fiction. Is, may, may I ask actually a question? Um, do you have also answer to this question after this project? Sorry? Do you have an answer to this question after this but project? But women... Uh... Yes, what if uh, women ruled the world? <clears throat> <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's a... Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm for the moment that this will really happen in reality. I think it's... Uh, I mean, th there are the governments that... Uh, uh, Women are in, uh, mostly in, in majority uh, in Finland and um, where else in Sweden. There were, uh, but I, I do believe it's a shift in the paradigm shift. It's, it is a, um, very difficult to very. I, I find it extremely. It's a difficult question and it's very very difficult to answer. And and and. Um, I mean, there are matriarchal society, we know it, but they are not in the, this part of the world that uh, we live. So, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a different uh, game. So, it's hard. I think it will be certainly different. <laughs> oh, yes, sure. <laughs> well, at, um, at first, I was really convinced that it would make any difference because I do believe that people who reach certain positions of power whether they be men or women, are, are going to have to be rather ruthless and unprincipled to maintain that position there, regardless of gender. But what I thought was so great about your thought experiment is that everyone around the table was female. And I think maybe that doesn't even make a difference necessarily to the substance of the arguments, but it changes the style of the conversation. Um, we know that women are not socialized to interrupt each other much. They speak more briefly, and that can really disadvantage them when they're in a mixed setting. But when it's all women, that, that should bring something different. But I really have to add, it's women in Europe. It will be very different, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a different part of the world. Oh, I agree. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, at one point, um, Farah, um, one of the specialists in the film, uh, says, I don't think we should romanticize female leadership. Do we romanticize female leadership? Um, yeah, sometimes. Um, um, I think what is important is actually wise leadership, uh, no matter whether it is a female or a male. But what I personally believe in it, uh, and that's actually uh, um, uh, totally opposite of masculinity, is feminine leadership. And feminine leadership, um, actually also a, a male could be a feminine leader. You don't need to be female. I mean, this is the difference between gender and also the... the, the, the uh, um, how do you say, the, the capacity uh, and capability to actually uh, um, act differently, to act uh, more empathetic, uh, to understand the other, to try to really have a conversation, to do, listen. Do you have and a male leader spring into your mind when you talk about feminine leadership? Yes, 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 yes. I mean, I... Um, um, not, not maybe necessarily in Europe, uh, but also in other places. I have worked also, and especially with young male uh, 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 leaders, new generation, very much uh, um, concerned about uh, climate change, very much concerned about uh, you, you know the situation in. Uh, 
um, in authoritarian uh, um, uh, countries. So uh, they really show more and more this attitude of, uh, I would say, f feminine uh, attitudes. And that's, that's, this is something important that I would wish for my son and I would wish for actually for our sons and for our children that they have much more this uh, the, the ability of being uh, feminine leaders. Yeah. Um, as you know, in Iran, we have now a, a situation which actually started with, I would say, clearly uh, female leadership. Uh, the young women went on the streets and really it, everything started with the young women. But what was very important, and I think we have really to keep emphasize that, was that the young men joined and they are now really jointly uh, uh, fighting and uh, uh, fighting for freedom, for uh, uh, for a democratic future, for a, for a different future than what they have now. And that, and I I have been amazed by seeing their courage, by seeing this uh, collaboration, and by seeing that it is not only female, male, but really as human beings, so we don't want this, we want something else. How does that compare to uh, 1979? Because you were, as a student in Iran, you, you witnessed the revolution yes. back, back then. Um, that was not a female, uh, I mean, we were active, uh, just uh, I have here luckily also uh, one of uh, really our uh, most active uh, uh, women rights activists here, uh, uh, Mansoura Shujai. Um, uh, we are indeed from the generation that participated in the revolution 1979. And, um, but that was definitely a male-dominated, male-guided, uh, what you want. Uh, we were participating in it, but we didn't define actually the outcome. We didn't really define the, uh, uh, the, the, the future of the revolution. And this is totally different now, 43 years later. And the interesting to, thing to me is that the whole ideology of the system, the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, has been very much towards you know, male domination. Uh, the female are actually half of the male, uh, and everything, everything is oppressing the, uh, the women, and uh, men have, uh, of course, this perfect uh, position. But the result is, after 40 years, the result is this young women. Mm. Going on the street and saying we don't want, and we are human beings, and we have our rights, and we are now fighting for our rights. And that's that's when if what if women rule the world? Yeah, something mm -hmm. like this. <laughs> um, I would like to hear your uh, idealistic version of a world ruled by women just in a little bit. But uh, Marlies, um, first, I would like to ask you. One of the experts in the film says um, or asks, "What does it mean to be a great power or superpower? Um, is it possible to think about or?" answer this question without thinking about military power and, and weapons, nuclear weapons? Um, yes, I think actually it is quite possible and almost necessary today to think about a superpower even as not necessarily being a state. I rather believe that, that the empires of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are also a kind of superpower, not the utopian superpower that Yael has, has shown us at all. But um, so, and on the other hand, I, I would not argue that the United Kingdom and France are superpowers any longer, even though they do have nuclear capabilities. So I think you can really separate those. Yes, but if you um, enter into disarmament, then you definitely lose your one of your superpowers. Look at North Korea. If they are going to uh, get rid of their uh, nuclear weapons, then they well, it's the end of. Th this is what I was trying to say about how, as international relations scholars, we know almost nothing. Um, we, we call this kind of the shadow of the nuclear weapons because you don't actually use them. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether it gives you any advantage at all. Um, there 
is some research that suggests that in an asymmetric conflict, the, the, the nuclear power, i.e., for instance, Russia, will be a little bit more likely to be the aggressor or to yeah, be aggressive. But there is great disagreement over whether it actually helps them, whether it helps the nuclear power have their way. So we actually really do not know whether having nuclear capabilities give you, gives you anything extra. Because fortunately, we have very little of what we kind of clinically call relevant observations, i.e. interstate wars. So we haven't had enough interstate wars between nuclear powers, between one nuclear and a non-nuclear power, to be able to definitively decide this. But it's certainly not the case, as conventional wisdom would have it, that we know having nuclear weapons helps you um, throw your weight around in the political world. Clear. I, w I would actually to, like to add that actually it is a very, very strong political tool to have or not to have we uh, nuclear weapons. I mean, at least in the, when Bibi Netanyahu is talking about Iran, you know, he's using it as a tool to hold control over a population. You know, it is a, it is a very strong political uh, means to, to rule and keep, uh, keep power, keep in power. Yes, know? I think in relation to your own population, yes. yeah. um, but it doesn't have to be a nuclear threat. The terrorist threat did amazing things for the Bush government. So yeah, yeah. being no, able to evoke still... that threat of the other uh, has often been used by, by political leaders, democratic or authoritarian. But I mean, how do you relate that? We know in the Second World War there was a use of, you know, in, in Japan, of course, and there, is, there were many, many consequences, especially over uh, women's body, over uh, inability to, for pregnancy. I mean, they're, they're all effect, affected very, very clearly on women. Uh, this, this is some of the research, at least, that one of the experts is dealing with. And so it, it's, I'm surprised that we don't know much about it. Anyway, so if, if I may speak up for the men, it is an amazing fact that for more than 75 years now, they have succeeded in not nu using nuclear weapons. There is such a strong moral norm yeah. to not do that, that I almost think, you know, what if women ruled the world? On this specific topic of not using that horrifying, annihilating weapon, so far so good. Even with male Let's leadership. Let's see now with uh, Putin. Yeah, mm. <laughs> so, uh, your project is uh, also a starting point to rethink a male-dominated world, to rethink the whole system. Um, when you, as an artist, um, fantasize about a female-dominated world, <laughs> what would be the core values? What would that world look like? I, I, my hope, and I, I really believe that women have different priorities. Um, and I, I and in, in fact, I mean, women have been for many, 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 many years uh, removed from rights, um, uh, repressed, deep, and and, um, and I think uh, it, it is. I'm, I'm not so naive as I may be seen, but I I I, I, I do think that the, it, it is absolutely. And I, I think like one of the one of the experts says, uh, we had enough men in power. We saw enough white men in power. I think it's just, it's about time to have uh, diversity, inclusiveness, and it is changing. Uh, it, it is not the same, uh, but, um, but then when I watched FIFA, then I'm like, oh my God, I am naive, you know? <laughs> like, who is ruling the, the world? Who is uh, in football, of course, uh, Patri patriarchal uh, system is very appearance, you know, money is ruling the world. And um, um, so I have this, uh, of course, I create, start to create a lot of ambivalency towards this, uh, my hope. Um, but yeah, um, they, 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 in Iran, for example, following the news, it is absolutely amazing what, what is uh, happening there. Uh, it gives a lot of optimism uh, that Things can change, but uh, I think it's a question of also of, of, reli uh, of religion, you know, uh, how it is so much controlling uh, our life. And uh, anyway, I should stop here. But uh, oh, just there's only one point that 
if you have war, you see that then these traditional gender roles are actually stronger, become more, more stronger. Now, that's what we see uh, also in Ukraine. I mean, the first thing that happened was, okay, the men stay home and the women are, you know, women and children, they are allowed to leave. And then you see what happens is, again, so men going uh, to the front and fighting, and that's, they are our heroes, and, uh, you know, women, again, uh, going out, so, uh, and becoming the refugees. So um, uh, the, the problem is that if we have this kind of situations where the violence is uh, used in a very, you know, uh, uh, a broad way, then uh, we, we see this traditional gender roles coming. We fall back. And so we fall back, and yeah. that's really awful to see. Yeah. Let's open up uh, the floor to questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Merlin will come to you with Mike. So I see one over there. Could you please stand up and tell us who you are and what is your question? Good evening. Thank you for the presentation for the film. I am Marina, and there is a sentence during the film that um, um, well, I remember more, and that is, uh, what, this is what happens when uh, the, you leave only one gender to rule the world. Then I also heard from Dr. Glasius this comment that um, it's difficult when in the conversation there are men and women who both uh, intervene because the space uh, that is given, or a man tends to um, to speak over, and so I would like to have a comment from you about the um, uh, the challenges and the opportunity that a dynamic that include men and women together could have. Who wants to take that question? Alice. Uh, I would say this about it. I think what Yelp may also have tried be trying to do with that that uh, male um, <laughs> fruit boy um, <laughs> is perhaps to say if, if you just kind of overnight invert everything and you know put all the women in positions of power, but you haven't actually deconstructed gender roles and power situations, then maybe not that much would change. Um, so if we're talking about utopias, I would almost go a bit further than thinking, you know, what if women ruled the world? And I think young people now are having conversations about going beyond gender, binary gender constructions. And when I heard the Scottish Parliament had adopted this law that 16-year-olds can now change their gender in their birth registry, I thought, first thought that was amazingly progressive. And then I thought, why do we actually register gender in birth registries? Why does the tax office or my employer or so many official instances actually need to know gender? So I think there's a lot further to go than to say, oh, let's have more women on top and more men in lower positions. Let's actually, you know, go beyond those binary gender roles. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, um, I'm trying to, okay, Christina von Braun was talking about it, that we are uh, not anymore. So at least in her mind, we are beyond patriarchal society. As she speaks about being anthropologist and being like seeing uh, uh, for a longer future or she goes back, you know, like she starts with the, um, she goes back uh, in, in time, in, in her mind, I, I assume because I know her quite well and the, the, the way she, the gender roles happens, you know, um, nature, culture, men, women, all this stuff, um, uh, female, male, it's, uh, it's always a, um, <clears throat> so she already indicates that there is a change. There is a change in the society, uh, talking about uh, uh, canceling gender and non-binary. Um, society in all its diversity. Yeah, it, it, I, I wonder if this will really affect how it's going. What happens to when non-gender people will sit in, in power, you know, when they have to decide about disarmament or not? How is this affecting it? I don't know. Um, 
Or yeah, is it wouldn't it... have to be all people who identify as non-binary. The point is they sit there first and foremost as human yeah. beings. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think actually that's, if I understood your question uh, correctly, um, that is the current, more or less current dynamic. Uh, we see now more mixed tables. Uh, oh, also, in international organizations, we have uh, the director of um, uh, World Bank being a woman, or, you know, so um, um, really big institutions are now led by women. We had uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel for uh, 16 years uh, running the country. <laughs> and being part of so many of these discussions and uh, sitting around the table. So we are uh, at least, uh, we are going in that direction that we have more and more actually, you know, also women with in powerful positions uh, sitting around the table. But still, what we talked about romanticizing female leadership and when you talk about these women. Um, uh, I was also thinking of uh, Jacinda Ardern, yes. who announced a re resignation, uh, New Zealand's prime minister uh, earlier this week. Uh, we have Christine Lagarde at the ECB. ECB. All these women, but we are looking at them as women more than, well, the fact that they are women leaders, it, it places a lot of um, stress on them, I think, or maybe uh, that's my uh, vision. We romanticize the fact that they are doing this and even like just in the Arden getting a child during her uh, term. I, I, I am not romanticize that. I mean, this is a fact. Mm -hmm. And they are women. True. And, um, and by, uh, what I have seen uh, with all these women acting, uh, uh, you know, in, in these positions is sometimes uh, they have indeed a different approach, and they bring a different approach to uh, to the to the room, uh, just by let's say saying, okay, first I want to hear everything to listen before I am going to say this is my position and this is what I, what I want. I mean, uh, Chancellor Merkel was criticized for this doing like this, you know, first uh, wanting to know everything and listening to everybody and finally coming up with, with her own position. And yes, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand, I mean, uh, she did things that was really very new to all of us, you know, taking your uh, baby with you to the United Nations and so on, but that's fine. I mean, that shows also what it means being a young woman in such a situation and trying to actually combine your position, your power position with uh, being a woman. Uh, and I think we have to get used to it. That's the only thing. We have to get used to it so that this is the way that is going to be from, from now on. <laughs> or, yeah. yeah. Are there any more questions? If so, please raise your hand. No? Okay. Okay, uh, there's one. I knew if I waited long enough. One on the front row. Thank you. Um, my name is Jenneke. Very inspiring, well, documentary or film. Um, I was actually thinking about the, the, the matriarchal societies. They were mentioned, and I think they're mainly, well, examples of it in the global south. Um, and I was wondering if there are um, elements in those examples or in those societies that are, well, very successful or, um, well, uh, positive examples of elements that we could include in the way thinking about, well, more women ruling the world or societies or countries, if you have. Well, well it, it's mo mostly, as far as I understood, um, it, it, it's uh, the approach to family. It's very different uh, roles, um, men and women roles in the in the in the, the family situation and and leadership. Uh, mostly women are in in a leader leadership positions and uh, and there is less hierarchy. There's um, I think even no, no hierarchy in the in the in the community. 
Um, I've met uh, also in Brazil during my research uh, about the uh, matriarchal society, a uh, very different approach. They, they, they really show men their, their, their place if they misbehave, you know, <laughs> which is very, very impressive. And they don't mind that they go to the government of Brasilia to, t to, to take part in the parliament or whatever, as long as they take on a, a ruling, the, the kind of manage the, the, the community and understand priority, understand uh, that the kids have to get education properly, that uh, there should be no violence. And it, I mean, it starts there. And I think this is uh, before we talk about nuke and uh, all this stuff, we should uh, really talk about uh, what happens at home, domestic violence, you know, what, um, <clears throat> um, how, how kids are being educated, understanding, uh, you know, and uh, how to behave in society. I think it all should start there. And, and this film actually should really be, be, be shown in schools. Yeah. What, what is your next step? Is the project finished or will there be a <laughs> I'm, sequel? I'm finished. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <clears throat> when are we um, going to rule the world? <laughs> I, 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 I would say that the, my fantasy back two years before the pandemic, so everything was filmed before the pandemic. You see they're shaking hands and it's every, very easy, you know, every, easy going. Um, I really wanted to bring the project uh, to uh, um, conflict zones. And because I'm 100% sure it would be very, very different uh, conversation. Um, Do you have plans for that? <clears throat> I cannot. I mean, it is a conflict zone. It's very hard to. Um, no, but I, it was just no, no opportunity. Uh, I've been in touch with uh, um, some activist and policy uh, peace policy maker, but um, unfortunately, it didn't happen. But anyone here, you can like still dream. <laughs> I mean, it is uh, essentially an experimental project where women, as, as many as more women get the experience to be involved in such project. I really, it really affected many of the women. Uh, I, I've received, you know, personally feedback uh, how, how, how much, um, how, how important it was for them to be in the situation, and, uh, and also they had fun, but never that, you know, like. What really did it? What did it do for them? What change did it make? Well, to be among only women, you know, it was uh, they have been hurt in a different way. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's very simple. It's uh, in the end. Okay, so let's see where where this um, film will end up. Hopefully, uh, across the whole Netflix. world. Netflix. Netflix. <laughs> well, who knows? <laughs> um, we're almost at the end. Just just a second. Um, uh, at, uh, we're almost at the end of this inspiring evening. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight, and uh, thank you for watching uh, via the live stream. Um, in the film, it's two minutes to midnight. The actual doomsday clock is uh, 100 seconds to midnight. But in three days' time, uh, scientists will set the clock again on the 24th of January. So we will uh, get to know what time it is. Um, the film, Two Minutes to Midnight, will be shown at Annette Geling Gallery until the 11th of February. So have, if you haven't seen it already, go and see it. And I want to thank you so much for joining us. Marlies Glazius. Farah Karimi, and of course, a big thank you to the artist Jael Bartana. <laughs>